So today's another one of those exciting days. As a pastor, I get to do some extra fun things uh, that we don't always get to do. Um, but uh, uh, one of the beautiful parts of God's creation is he told us to procreate and to have children and to add to the church number daily. And I figure if we can't bring them in and be saved, we might as well have babies and have them be saved that way and bring them into the church and uh, celebrate with a growing church. And we've got a lot of young people, uh, lo young little ones in our nursery, our nursery workers, give them credit. When you see them, just thank them for the work and the time that they serve in our nursery ministry. It's so good to have them be there. Uh, today, we're gonna celebrate with a precious little life cult uh, this morning. I'm gonna invite Janelle and Josh uh, Geringer to come. And uh, any of the family or friends, I know this is always awkward and weird, but I gave, they gave you a fair warning. Uh, if you would come with them as well and support uh, as we kind of share in this dedication this morning um, with Colt today. <coughs> you guys can kind of come up here. All right. They're all coming. They're coming from all over. The masses. <laughs> Perfect. What a beautiful picture. See, now, see, they saw some come. Now they're like, oh, yes, we'll come. <laughs> All right, come on up. It's good. All good. I know it's what well, we're visiting. We don't want to be a spectacle today. Look, this is not about you. This is about Colt. And this is about our love for Colt and being able to present him to the Lord today. And uh, so excited to have you guys here and to share in this special uh, day today. It's always a joy for me and for us as a church to celebrate with parents the blessing that God has given to us. Today we're celebrating in a special way with Josh and Janelle Geringer the dedication of Colt Joshua to God. One of the most important responsibilities that we have as parents and guardians is to teach our children to love and to obey Jesus. We do that by loving them with the great love that has already been given to us by our Heavenly Father. As believers, we are called to recognize that children belong first and foremost to God. God in his goodness gives children as gifts to parents. They not only have the awesome responsibility of caring for this gift, but the wonderful privilege of enjoying the gift. Because children belong to God and are given as grace as gifts to parents, it is only proper and appropriate that children be dedicated to God. Josh and Janelle, that is exactly what you guys are doing here today. Declaring that God is the most important by bringing Colt to the house of the Lord and specifically to Jesus himself. You are paving the way for Colt to know and understand the love and the plans that God has for him. No doubt Colt is special to you and you, you have only the highest dreams for him. But make no mistake, as much as you love him and as great as your dreams are for him, God loves him even more and has even bigger dreams for him. And I want you to think about that this morning. One of the first responsibilities that we have as parents is giving our children a name. A name is significant as it sets the tone for our identity throughout life. So many couples spend so much time trying to find the right name for their children. I don't know exactly what ultimately led you to choose Colt, but as I thought about this name, I reflected on the characteristics of a young horse. Strong, energetic, fast, full of life. And then I quickly remembered that it was a colt that carried Jesus into Jerusalem and initiated the sequence of events that would lead to the greatest demonstration of love for us. May colt live up to this very high calling and carry the hope and message of Jesus to a world desperate for love. Josh and Janelle, I want to draw your attention to the commands that God has recorded in the scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road when you lie down, and when you get up. In order for Colt to follow the path that God has ordained for him, it is your responsibility as parents to model and teach him early the ways of God, to watch over his education, to direct his mind toward the scriptures and restrain him from harmful relationships, and of course to raise him up in the 
nurture, and instruction of the Lord. If you will set out to do this, will you repeat after me? It is with great gratitude and joy that we dedicate Colt to God. Colt is the Lord's to do with as he pleases. We will love him, care for all his needs, and do our best to lead him to a relationship with Jesus. To the extended family that is here today, you are here not by accident. You are here by choice. One, because mom and dad asked you to come. But also because you love them and you love Colt. And you certainly have a desire to see Colt become the man that God wants him to be. You also have an important role in Colt's life. Your prayers and Christ-like example will influence him to grow in Christian maturity. If you will commit yourself to re fulfilling your responsibilities to help Colt grow and mature to be the man that God wants him to be, will you now repeat after me? To the best of our ability, we will model a Christ-like example for Colt. We will pray for him consistently. We will support Josh and Janelle as they set out to make a Christian home. So help us God. Amen. And of course, church, by now you know that I bring you a challenge as well. Because as a congregation, we share in the responsibility of helping to influence and raise Colt to be the man that God wants him to be. Colt will learn from our example of worship. He will learn to understand and apply God's word as he sees us living out God's word. He will learn to love people based on how we love people. It won't be long before Colt, like many of the other kids, are running around the church bringing energy and excitement to our church. As his brother does. As kids do, they will begin to test the waters to understand what is okay and what is not. It is through these early years that many of the habits and priorities that they will hold to throughout life will be developed and tested. No, as a congregation, we are not parents, their parents, his parents but we do share in the responsibility in helping them to shape and mold Colt to be the man that, he wants him, that God wants him to be. To instruct, to care, to love, to challenge, and to invest in his life. If you will agree to this, would you stand and show your support with me this morning and repeat after me? We will do our part to love Colt. We will pray for him. We will teach him the ways of the Lord. And we will model God's love for him. Josh and Janelle, I want you to pause in just for a moment here. Sometimes this is surreal. You're up in front and you're like, is this done yet? <laughs> but what I want you to see is you are not alone. You've got an amazing and beautiful family who is here to support you. And they're gonna help you through that process. This is also your family. And we are here for you in the good and the bad. We all won't always get it right. <laughs> but together, we are gonna make champions of our children. And we wanna see that happen. He agrees. <laughs> Look at that smile. I love it. I love it. All right. Well, let's, uh, can I hold them? All right. Come here, big guy. All right. Let's say hi to our church family, Colt. Look at that guy. Isn't that something? Hello. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I love it. Awesome. All right. Can we pray together? Father God, we love you so very, very much. Father, what a privilege as it is to gather together today and to celebrate with Josh and Janelle and their family and as a church family and celebrate precious Colt's life. Lord, we know that you've got amazing things in store for him. And as he rests here in my arms today, he is filled with just an innocence, a purity of, of new life. And the whole world of opportunity is in front of him. 
But Lord, we know that the world that he's been born into isn't always easy and sometimes there are challenges and the enemy is going to war for him. And so we pray against that today. We pray, God, that your wisdom and your strength is stronger. And from the earliest of days, we pray that he would know you and follow you. That, Lord, he would center his life in you. That we as a church family and as his extended family would support Josh and Janelle to help him to see you and to know you in real and authentic ways. Lord Jesus, Colt is a special, precious young, young man who will grow up to be an amazing man to follow you. We believe that as we commit this promise to you as you've promised to us. So now we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we dedicate Colt back to you. We love you, Jesus. And all God's people said, amen, amen. All right, there he is. I know, I know. All right, we have a couple things for you here just in dedication. Certainly we have kind of a certificate to re remember this day. And we've got three roses here, uh, each representing something a little bit different. Uh, the white rose kind of represents a symbol of purity and reminding you of the responsibility that you guys have as parents to model that life of purity for Colt and, and to understand that, um, that the way that he learns to live uh, according to the plans that God has for him is by the way that you model that for him and example that for him. Which leads us to the red rose, a symbol of strength and the responsibility that you have to instruct him in um, a, a good reputation and how strong a name is and holding that, you know, together. And the pink rose is a blending of the two, representing Colt's life and what that will blend in together. And uh, those should be a reminder of just the formation and the way that God is shaping in you guys as a family and certainly what God has in store for him and for you guys together. So we love you so very much. Would you tell them how much you love them and show them how much you thank them for me? Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Lots of good things going on in the life of the church. We get to celebrate new life and dedications and baptisms and all kinds of things that God is doing in our lives. But there's also a lot of just kind of activity and busyness things that we have going on in the life of the church. I don't have time this morning uh, to go through all the details. You can read it. You're smart people, right? We put a bulletin together every week and put a lot of details in there to make sure that you know what's going on. We also, if you haven't noticed by now or we don't have your email, every Thursday morning we send out an in-the-know email that basically gives you a reminder and an update because we don't want to we want to make sure that you don't miss anything uh, as far as ways to connect and to plug into the life of our church. We also put it out on our social media Facebook pages and uh, we invite you to connect with us there there where you can uh, make sure that you have the information and then can necessarily ask the follow-up questions or anything that you would need so that you can be plugged in uh, to the things that are happening uh, in our church. A couple things that I do want to draw your attention to. First and foremost, I'm really excited. Next Sunday, we'll be beginning our revival week. Uh, so Sunday morning, Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday, Pastor Kerry Willis is going to be here with us, leading us as uh, uh, kind of in a week of spiritual formation. And I realize to kind of take that chunk of time out and already busy schedules is difficult as sometimes to do. But I would highly encourage you to find some ways this week to reorient and to move some things around as much as possible to be involved in as much of these services as you possibly can because I do believe that God wants to do something in our church. I believe he wants to do something among us and uh, you know it doesn't mean that you have to be at revival for that to happen but it sure would help and uh, certainly would invite you to kind of be a part of that. Invite your friends and family to come and be a part of that as much as you possibly can as we uh, just kind of listen to what God has got in store for us going forward. Also, hot off the presses, so hot, I wasn't able to get into the bulletin. On Thursday afternoon, I met with Pastor Wayne Krell and Pastor Steve Vaughn. Uh, Wayne is the pastor at the Mifflinburg Naz Nazarene Church and Pastor Steve is at our Crossroads Nazarene Church. Um, coming up the following Sunday, Sunday sep the 22nd in the evening, teens, our three youth groups are getting together. You're going to be doing some field games and things out outside here, so that's going to be fun. Um, but we are gathering together as a, as a zone, the Susquehanna Valley Zone and all the other churches in our zone. And we're meeting here at our church for a night of prayer and just kind of coming together as kind of the district church. And, uh, you know, it's important that, you know, we celebrate celebrate you know who we are in our local churches and what God is doing among us but it's also important that we realize and dem and work together in the church that we are in the bigger family that we are because we are much bigger than one church
and uh, would encourage you to come and be a part of that. We got a lot going on that week, um, and so I realize it's, it's another night out, um, but there is power in prayer when God's people come together, and there's no telling what God can do. And I do believe he wants to do some things for us here. Uh, so, so come and be a part of that. Also, uh, still bus tickets, uh, concert tickets for the Casting Crowns uh, Elevation and Hillsong concert coming up. Uh, so see the church office uh, and make sure that you get uh, those tickets before they're gone. Uh, those will be uh, uh, available until they're gone. And so hopefully you can come and join us and be a part of that fun experience. One last announcement, an exciting announcement. A um, couple weeks ago, you'll remember, we invited a pastoral candidate in to interview for the position of youth and young adult pastor in our church. Uh, pastor Desiree and Jeremy were here, and uh, we just uh, celebrate with them as we've been kind of praying through and working through that. Just found out this week they have accepted the position that we offered them. And so we're excited to be able to welcome them to our church family. Uh, they probably won't be here till the middle of October, maybe even the end of October, depending on logistics. We're still ironing out those details. But we are really excited to have uh, Pastor Desiree and her husband Jeremy and her, uh, their kids, uh, Brooke and uh, Tristan, uh, who will be coming with them. Um, you can be praying for them as they prepare for that transition. They're actually talked with uh, Desiree this week and they're pl planning to inform their youth group on Wednesday night. So if you think about it, be praying for them. That's always a difficult conversation, um, you know, to kind of process with, you know, the kids that you're leaving and working with uh, and why God is moving you to a new group and all of those questions that kind of walk through that. We're excited to have her come and their family come, but before that happens, there's still a lot of steps that have to kind of go, go into place. So we'll be giving more information as we have it. Uh, but I did want to celebrate with you and let you know that uh, they will be joining us in the very near future. So we're really, really excited about that. At this time, if our ushers will come forward, we'll receive our morning tithes and offerings. Father God, we love you so very much. And uh, today is a great day filled with your presence. And we are just looking forward to just being able to be used by you in many ways. One of the ways that we serve and worship you is through the giving of your tithes and our offerings. So Father, as we give faithfully to you today, uh, Lord, would you bless those who give? And would you also lead us as a church to know how to use them according to the ministry plans that you are shaping for us? Lord, we love you. Pray that you would guide us and direct us. In your name we pray, amen. So how do we define a hero? Superpowers and a mask. Ooh, and a cape. Oh, no cape, too dangerous. Uh, no. Um, okay, well, how about a cool name like Master Defender or the Ultimate Vindicator? I think we're getting a little off track here. Really? You said a hero. Yes, but I'm talking about a real person, not a superhero out of a comic book. Maybe someone with unusual strength. No, but... Um, or someone who has no fear no matter what comes their way. Not quite, but I think you're getting warmer. Okay. So, what is a hero? I think a hero is one who loves. <laughs> what, like roses and kisses and hugs? Seriously, you may be watching a few too many movies. No, I'm talking about real love. Real love? Yes, think about it. Love protects. It hopes. Love perseveres. It puts others first. And it doesn't delight in evil. Love protects. Exactly. Regardless of how scary the situation, a hero defends people anyway. Why is that? Um, courage? Courage. Compelled by love. Hmm. Well, what if that person doesn't deserve protection? Well, love protects and hopes anyway, without keeping record of wrong. But what if that person isn't grateful for that protection? Love is not self-seeking. True heroes don't serve for what they get in return. But won't they heroes get discouraged? They can, but love hopes and perseveres anyway. What if those being protected never even know the cost? Again, 
Love seeks the good of others above its own. Love sacrifices. But what if the cost is high? Like, really high? Well, John 15, 13 says it like this. No one has greater love than this, that one lays down his life for his friends. But can a hero really, well, die? Yes, they can. These people are, these heroes are people, just like you and me. They, they're just like everyone else. They're imperfect. They deal with fear and discouragement, and they get it wrong sometimes. Like me. Well, regardless, they've chosen to love in an extraordinary way, without even realizing it. Well, in many of these human heroes have demonstrated a spiritual truth. Sacrificial love. Exactly. But Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his own love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus, God's Son, was absolutely perfect and blameless. He delayed down his life for us, that we could experience freedom from sin and the penalty and enslavement. But then he did what no other superhero could do on his own, no matter how amazing he or she is, he rose from the grave and he reigns for eternity to intercede for us. He rescued us. I want all the human heroes to know what God has done for them. Me too. And I wish I could say thank you to each and every one. So do I. Well, for now, we can remember those who sacrificed, and we can thank God for them. And we can pray for those still serving. And we can honor, honor them by emulating that kind of selfless love. Lord, thank you for those heroes in our lives who have protected, sacrificed, and loved. And God, may you honor them with great favor. Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you this morning to turn directly with me to the scripture lesson this morning. We've been in a sermon series uh, entitled Honoring Marriage for the last several weeks. And the scripture lesson has been a very familiar scripture reference uh, as we look at it each and every week. Genesis chapter 2, 24 through 25. Power verse of scripture. That's not where we're turning this morning, all right? So we're going to look at Romans this morning. Romans chapter 5, found in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 6. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Beginning at verse 6. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, no one is likely to die for a good person, though someone might die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's judgment. For since we were restored to friendship with God by death of his son, while we were still enemies, we will certainly be delivered from eternal punishment by his life. So now we can rejoice in the wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in making us friends of God. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we do thank you again for your word and for your instruction. We thank you for God the way in which you lead us to know and understand the plans that you have for us. Lord, in these recent weeks we've been unpacking how to honor marriage and the relationship covenant that we have established with our spouse or we one day establish. Lord, today as we unpack these words of scripture, as we look at a unique story, uh, Lord God, would you kind of open our hearts to uh, what we need in order to establish and restore uh, the healthy marriage covenant that you have planned for us. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated this morning. So... 
Some of you, maybe more analytic, analytical thinkers, are looking at that scripture lesson or reading that we just did here this morning, and you might be asking yourself, how does this pertain to honoring marriage? Because as I read it, as I look through, as I listen to these words being shared, what I hear is God speaking to us about his relationship with us, about how committed he is to us and what, to what lengths he's willing to go for us so that we might know who he is in his love. And for sure, you would be right. You have heard right that even though we have turned our back on God, even though we have um, uh, become an enemy of God, God has sti still seen fit to go to extreme measures to demonstrate and prove to us that he is all in on us, even though we don't deserve it, so that we are now friends of God. Absolutely, that is what the scripture is teaching. But one of the things that I've also learned about the scripture as I have studied it is that God is the master at multiple layers of interpretation, of multiple layers of understanding. And one of the things about God in the way that he has designed creation, the way that he has designed kind of his people and the way that we relate and get to know each other is that there are some similarities in the way that God relates to us as to how he has designed us to relate to one another. To relate to one another within a spousal relationship, to relate to our children, to our extended family, to our church family, to those we get along with, to those that we don't. And as I look at these words of scripture this morning, I believe that they serve a beautiful foundation for the covenant of marriage that you and I uh, have been studying over recent weeks. In these weeks, we have been unpacking the covenant design of marriage that is found in Genesis chapter 2, 24 through 25, as well as looking at the covenant promise that many of us have made or will make at some point in our lives. By now, hopefully, we have a clearer picture about how our marriage promise is tied and linked to God's marriage design. The foundation of this is found in the reality that the marriage covenant is more about how I can give myself away to my spouse more completely rather than what I can get out of this particular relationship. This understanding is best applied when we acknowledge that the love that we have to give is love that we have first received directly from God. In John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we are reminded that the reason in which we are able to love in the way that we do is because we were first loved by God. I don't know about you, but if you're anything like me, there is nothing like a good story to help me understand and to live out the lessons being taught to help me to live out and apply what God is calling me to do. In other words, I think this morning it would be good for us to hear a story. To hear the, how a story, how we can experience that story and live it out practically in our own journey in life. And so this morning, I want to tell you a story of extravagant love. A story about a man who followed God who served God, who his sole desire was to make God proud. The story of a man named Hosea and his wife, Gomer. I'd invite you to turn with me, if you'd like, to the book of Hosea in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's one of those harder ones to find sometimes. So you open up to the middle of your Bible, you'll find Psalms. Flip over, you'll find Proverbs. Keep growing, you'll find Isaiah come over somewhere in there you'll find, probably find Ezekiel or Jeremiah somewhere in there you'll come to Daniel and the very next book is Hosea all right I know it's one of those hard ones but I'll give you I'll walk you through it all right this morning I am preaching on the entirety of this book 14 chapters I get to talk to you about this morning whoo I'm excited some of you are saying good lord pastor you can preach for four hours on one verse Yes, I can. But I promise you this morning, I won't go line for line in 14 chapters. But I do have some homework for you. I want to challenge you maybe this week to find some time to read the story of Hosea. 
from chapter 1 to chapter 14. You could probably do it if you're a good quick reader, maybe in about a half an hour. If you take a little bit longer, you could probably take about an hour and a half. But could you give God a little bit of time to just kind of see the story unfold, even though you may not understand all of the details? Just step back and listen to the details as God tells his story. Maybe filling in some of the blanks of what we're not able to get to this morning. Some of you might take the discipline of kind of meditating on the story and maybe every day this week, read the story again. You're never wrong to find yourself soaking the story of God. And in particular, this beautiful story. Now, any story of God, any, st sorry, any story that involves love and the ap application of love only makes sense to begin in where love comes from which we know comes from God because what? God is love, right? We've studied that. We know that. So in this story, this whole story begins in God himself. God is holy. And he has called us as well to be holy like him. Now I'm sure you've heard that phrase a thousand times, especially if you have grown up in the church, in particular a church in the holiness tradition like the church of the Nazarene. Because these are words of promise and instruction that we believe God has set in motion. That yes, he is holy. And yes, in fact, he has called us as his people to also be holy. Or maybe this is the first time you've ever heard such a phrase. That God is holy and calls us to be holy. But whether you're familiar with this phrase or not, I would venture to guess whether in this moment or at some point in your journey, you have asked yourself the question, that sounds good. It sounds like something I would like and it would be good to experience. But how in the world can I be holy like God is holy? I mean, that sounds, just in the way that it reads, in the way that it comes across my ears, it sounds like something that is so lofty. It is so otherworldly. It is something really unattainable. So why would God put that in front of us if we can't attain it? My argument would be, is that maybe we can attain it. Maybe it is more possible. I think in learning to answer this question, how do we become holy like God is holy, we might get a little bit closer also to understanding the extravagant and selfless love that is found in the story of God. The Bible defines holiness in many ways, but probably the most beautiful way that it describes it is found in the story of Hosea. Hosea, as I said, is a man of God. In Hosea chapter 1 verse 1, we see, we are introduced to Hosea as a single man. We're introduced to him as a man who is serving God, following God. He is a prophet of God, which means he is a spokesman of God. His job, his life's goal and aim is communicating the message of God with God's people. And as we begin to read this story, we see that he is faithfully following and being obedient to what God has for him. We get to verse 2. Um, and what we see is that God comes to Hosea with a message. God comes to Hosea with the specific message that I have good news for you. I have found you a wife and somebody to marry. So guys, as any of us would be, when you know that the light has been revealed to you and God has put that, shown that light for you and said, this is the woman that you are going to marry, we get excited because there's confidence in that. Right? It's not just something that I'm feeling. It's not just, well, I think she might be the right one. No, God has made it clear, this is the woman that I want you to marry. Now, you put yourself in Hosea's shoes. You hear that message and you start to think to yourself, this is great news. I am serving God. I am following God. I'm doing what he wants me to do. God has seen fit to bring favor in my life by bringing me a bride that I can share my life with, that I can become one with for the rest of my life. This is good and great and glorious news. You know there's a catch coming, don't you? Because as you continue to read in verse 2, what we begin to see is that God asks Hosea to do something a little bit crazy. And you know God has a history of doing some crazy things. He does it in all of it. My own life in the last two years has been turned upside down by the crazy ask of God. A little over two years ago, I received this phone call from our district pastor saying, hey, this group of people in Sealands Grove want to know if you'd be interested in coming and being their pastor. Newell, no. 
they're crazy or God is crazy, but somebody is crazy. No, we just bought our house six months ago. And we bought this house and we believe with all of our heart that this was the promise the answer to the promise that you had given us, that you would provide us a house of our own. For 17 years, we had been praying for this house. And God had finally answered our prayer, and we had it, and we were living in it for six months, and I get a phone call. I got a crazy ask for you. And it wasn't my district pastor. It wasn't even you guys. It was God wanting to know if I'd be willing to do something crazy. Now, fast forward almost two years later, I can tell you that when you follow God's crazy ask, it is always worth it. Can I tell you, I am excited to be the pastor of this church. I believe with all of my heart, my wife and I were just having this conversation yesterday as we were traveling to a district meeting back closer to where we were from. And we were thinking to ourselves and just talking through how much God has just given us an incredible love for this people, for this church and how we believe with all of our heart that God's got more in store than we have even begun to scratch the surface for here in this church. God has a crazy ass, but when we are obedient to it, he has crazy solutions too, if we're willing to take a step of faith and try it. But don't just take my story and my word for it. God has a history of doing the crazy ass. You know a man by the name of Abram in the Bible? The man who God said, look, I'm gonna make you the father of a great nation. But he started getting older and older and older and older and to the point where it is unrealistic for a man of his age to have a child, let alone for his wife to bear a child at that age. But I promise that I'm going to make you the father of a great nation. And at a very, very old, hundred-year-old age, they're given a child. The child whom will be the one whom God will bring the answer to this crazy solution in front of them that he would be the father of a great nation. This child is born. This child starts to grow and raise. They have a love for this child. There is a specialness about this child. And then out of nowhere, God comes to Abram and says, hey, guess what? I got an ask for you. You know that son, the one who will be the solution to making you the father of a great nation? Take him to the mountain and go sacrifice him. What? <laughs> I'm a little deaf. Lord, say that again. You want me to do what? The one you've given me, the promise you've given me, and now you want me to take him and sacrifice him. How in the world? Let's just put aside the fact that you want me to kill my son. How in the world are you going to fulfill the promise and make me the father of a great nation if I don't have an heir to make that possible? I tried doing it my own way. I had a child with my wife's maidservant, and that you told me was wrong. So that can't be the way you're going to do it. You said it was going to be through Isaac. You said this was the way you're going to work it out. Now I have to go and kill my son. You are crazy. You ever feel like telling the Lord he's crazy? Right? Don't be naive. You know you tell the Lord he's crazy all the time. You're afraid to because you're just like, where's the lightning? But God is crazy sometimes. He asks us to do some pretty crazy things. And that is exactly what's happening here in the story of Hosea. Hosea, I've got the wife, the perfect, beautifulest, bestest wife that I could find for you. Her name is Gomer. Look, don't make fun of the name. <laughs> seriously, and I hope there's no Gomers here this morning. But, but seriously, Gomer, she must have had some really mean parents. I mean, really, come on. But that is not the crazy part of the story. The crazy part of the story is that she is well known as the town prostitute. What? God, you want me to marry who? You are crazy. You have lost your mind. There is no way that you can bring anything good out of me, a follower of you, somebody who is obedient and serving you and knowing you, and you could do anything good bringing me out into this relationship that is unevenly yoked. In fact, there's other scripture that teach it is not wise to marry somebody who is unevenly yoked with you. There is scripture that says, don't do the very thing you're telling me to do. What? How in the world do I make sense of this? You want me 
to marry somebody who is already not even being married being unfaithful, but most likely will be unfaithful with, to me at some point in my married relationship. Can you imagine what the talk in the community would be? Could you imagine how that would affect the integrity of the voice, a proclamation about what God is saying? When people say, oh sure, you're going to talk the voice of the Lord, but look at your wife. Man, there's a sermon in that one all over there. I got to be careful. I'll get stuck. Think about that one for a minute this morning, church, spouses. The responsibility you have for your spouse's reputation. I got to be careful. Think about it, though. This is the story. God is asking Hosea to do a crazy, unthinkable thing. Marry the town prostitute. I can only imagine the thoughts that Hosea was going through. God has asked me to do some crazy things, but I'm just saying I am glad I am not Hosea. I am glad that God did not ask me to do something that crazy. Now knowing that, he's going to ask me to do something even more crazy, but whatever. That's the way God works sometimes. He asks you to do a crazy. But then God goes on because God wants to reassure his prophet, and he explains to him the mode, the method to his madness. He explains that even though you're in shock, that this relationship between Hosea and Gomer is going to demonstrate the nature of God's love for his people and his faithfulness to his people. While Gomer's lack of faithfulness would demonstrate Israel's infidelity and her desire to chase after other gods. So as he understood what God's plan was, though it was still crazy, though he still had a lot of fear and doubt, he did what he needed to do. In verse 3, he was obedient and he took Gomer home to be his wife. Now I know, pause, you're, you're starting to get worried. Pastor, you're only on verse 3 and you said you're going through 14 chapters today. We're, we're making progress, believe me. We're making progress. In verse 3, Hosea brings Gomer home to be his wife. For a short time, probably even a little bit of a long time, Things are going well. The marriage is happening like happy marriages happen. They're enjoying being together and being a family. In fact, Gomer even gives birth to three of Hosea's children in this time period. All accounts, things are going well. Until we get to chapter 2, verse 5. And we take notice that Gomer has now returned to a life of prostitution. She has left Hosea and her children and returned to her old habits. Hosea is now heartbreak, heartbroken and he is crying out to God. He had done nothing to deserve this and yet his wife had strayed away from him. Not only was she pulling away from him, but she now was chasing and pursuing other guys. Probably the ultimate slap in the face. But we must remember that Hosea is a godly man, a prophet of God. He has committed his life to the service of God. What do we think he should do? How should Hosea respond? If you were in the role of giving advice to Hosea, what would you tell him? Probably for many of us, we would say, good riddance. You don't deserve this. You deserve somebody who would appreciate you. Maybe... Maybe we'd even encourage him to simply embrace the ministry philosophy that would be developed years later, generations later, by the Apostle Paul in the blessedness of singleness. That it is better to be single so as to devote all of your time and energy to the service of God. After all, that's what you, your life commitment is all about. And maybe having a wife or a spouse and a family is a distraction, and so you need to just focus on your service of God. And truthfully, in all of that wisdom, I don't know that any of that would necessarily be wrong. But that is probably the advice that many would give. What would you do if you found yourself in the similar situation of Hosea? What would be your response? What do you think Hosea is thinking his response should be? The better question is, what does God ask Hosea to do? After all, this whole story started because of God's ask. Now we're finding the story unfolding. What does God ask Hosea to do. Remember that this relationship in some ways is a parable. It is a word picture for how God it, uh, helps us to understand for how God loves his people and how committed he is. 
Though you and I might do something different, in chapter 3, verse 1, Hosea follows the lead of God and returns, maybe even chases and pursues his wife and desperately declares his love for her and his intention for her to come home to him and his family. Hosea was willing to forgive everything. He was willing to start fresh. All Gomer had to do is come home with him. Gomer said no. Gomer refused. Everything that Hosea was trying, he was willing to forgive, he was willing to start fresh, he was willing to let everything go in the background and start fresh. To which we look at Hosea and say, man, I'll give you props. Good effort. Certainly at that point, we might think to ourselves, well, you tried, she said no, so you're released, move on. Find healing, start fresh somewhere new, right? Get a new perspective. But no. Hosea does the unthinkable. He does the unthinkable in order to spend time, in order to protect uh, his wife from the dangers of the life that she had chosen, in order to fulfill the role of a loving husband. Verses 2 and 3, Hosea buys time with his own wife. Hosea is determined to let nothing stand in the way of the care of his wife, even if that meant paying the prostitute price to keep her safe. He shelled out, he paid the debt to what was owed so that he could bring her to a place of safety. So that if you're not gonna come willingly, I'm gonna find a way that I can protect you and I will pay the price for you. Church, do you understand the extravagant nature that Hosea has gone to? She doesn't want him. She wants nothing to do with him. She is demonstrating in a very aggressive manner, I am going another direction. Hosea says very well. If I can't have you the way I want you, I'll do whatever I can to protect you. I'll do whatever I can to love you. Kind of sounds like Romans chapter 5 to me. Kind of sounds like what Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us. And though we didn't deserve it, though we don't know... Uh, how to really apply how much God really loves us. Though we were still sinners, Christ paid the price. Christ shelled it out. He was willing to pay any price, go to any lengths to demonstrate just how much he loves you and me. Hosea loved his wife and he was willing to pay the price of the bed of prostitution in order to protect it and to love his wife. What a beautiful picture of God's love. When we as human beings stray away and chase other loves, God remains committed to us in our relationships with him. I didn't put this one on the screen in, in intentionally this morning because I want to challenge you right now to close your eyes. And I'm going to flip over to chapter 11. So yeah, I skipped a bunch of chapters for you this morning. Chapter 11, I think, is the most beautiful, poetic words of Scripture in all of the Bible that demonstrate this love. And I want you not to read it, not to get distracted by me, but I want you to hear these words as God speaks of his love for his people. When Israel was a child, I loved him as a son. I called my son out of Egypt, but the more I called to him, the more he rebelled, offering sacrifices to images of Baal and burning incense to idols. It was I who taught Israel how to walk, leading him along by the hand. But he doesn't know or even care that I, it was I who took care of him. I led Israel along with my ropes of kindness and love. I lifted the yoke from his neck and I myself stooped to feed him. <laughs> but since my people refuse to return to me, they will go back to Egypt and will be forced to serve Assyria. War will swirl through their cities. Their enemies will crash through their gates and destroy them, trapping them in their own evil plans. For my people are determined to desert me. They call me the Most High, but they don't truly honor me. Just a quick pause here, church. Hear these words. Understand, God isn't just talking to a, His people generations ago. God is talking to His church right here and right now. 
For my people are determined to desert me. They call me the Most High. They honor me with their words and with their lips and in their worship. But they, um, but they are determined not to honor me because it doesn't follow suit in their actions. We continually dismiss the advances that God is making for us. And hear God's heart again in verse 8. Oh, how can I give you up, Israel? How can I let you go? How can I destroy you like Adma and Zeboam? My heart is torn within me and my compassion overflows. No, I will not punish you as much as my burning anger tells me to. I will not dis completely destroy Israel for I am God and not mere mortal. I am the Holy One living among you and I will not come to destroy for someday the people will follow the Lord. I will roar like a lion and my people will return trembling from the west like, flo like a flock of birds. They will come from Egypt flying like doves. They will return from Assyria and I will bring them home again, says the Lord. Beautiful words that communicate the heart of God and the commitment that He is willing to go for His people. In his own sacrificial love, God refers to himself as holy. When I read this story and I think about this story, I tend to want to think about it in terms of myself being Hosea. That God is asking me to demonstrate my love in some extravagant and unimaginable way for my wife, for my children, for the priorities that God has given to me. And that God wants me to do something crazy in the way that I love these people that God has gifted to me in my life. I ask, does my love even that I possess even come close to the love and care demonstrated by Hosea to his wife, Gomer? But as much as I want to think of myself in the terms of, of Hosea, in reality, I am and we are Gomer in this story. We are the prostitute. We are the one who have strayed from God and the love that He has been pouring out for you and for me. All too often the holiness of God has been described as God's intolerance of anything that is sinful, ugly, or dirty. In this definition of God's holiness, God would be driven away by our infidelity and our unfaithfulness. But that is not what we see taking place here in the story of Hosea. Here we see God, a God whose holiness doesn't drive him away from us when we are unfaithful, but rather it drives him towards us. When we are unfaithful, it only compels God to draw closer to us. God is holy in that he loves us consistently and with the deepest loyalty. He loves us for richer and for poorer in sickness and in health, in plenty or in poverty, whether or not we are clean, whether or not we are obedient or loyal or worthy, even though, uh, even through the worst violations that we commit to God, God's love still powers through for us. In other words, God's holy love is not dependent on us returning love back to Him. In fact, God's holy love shines brightest when it hurts him the most. The cross is God's greatest evidence of God's suffering love for us. The ability to love when that love will meet pain and suffering and sacrifice, that is holiness. So to be holy as God is holy, to be holy like God is holy, simply means learning to love in a way that when we meet pain and suffering and sacrifice, we pursue and we push through with that extravagant love that God has displayed for us. If we are to be holy as He is holy, we must first and foremost receive this extravagant love from God. And then we can learn to share it with others. We are called to be people of God who love our spouses, to love men and women, boys and girls, and all of creation who have been loved by God freely, stubbornly, consistently, and sacrificially. If and when we do that, we stand out from the crowd without being separated from it. 
we are called to be saints. People who reflect a divine love and have received, received it to, and pass it on to anyone who has need of it. And by the way, we all have need of it all the time. God's extravagant love. The Forrest Gump movie years ago, Forrest Gump had a great line in that movie. I may not be a smart man, but I know what love is. Look, I may not be the smartest person in the world, but I know what love is. We may not be the smartest people in the world, but we, we can know what love is because it's been told to us very clearly. God is love. As I reflect in the story of Hosea and Gomer, love is displayed, the love that is displayed is extravagant. It's wasteful, it's forgetful, it's forgiving, it's sacrificial, bizarre, it's countercultural, painful, and yes, even relentless. But it is God. It is his love for us. Hosea's love for Gomer seems absolutely illogical. It makes no sense to me why he would pursue Gomer the way that he did, except for the fact that God is in it. And that's exactly how God has loved us. Like Gomer, we are left with a choice to accept this crazy, extravagant love or to continue to try to push it away. But in accepting this love, our intention should be to reflect the extravagant love of our own. Remember, experiencing the holiness of God is the ability to love when that love will meet pain and suffering and sacrifice. So my question for us this morning is, as you sit here today, have you been hurt? Have you felt disrespected in some way? Have you felt like you've been misunderstood? Your natural response is to respond based on how those feelings make you feel. But what if instead we learn to respond with the extravagant love of God that has been given to us? What if instead we chose to be Hosea rather than sit back and continue to be Gomer? I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up this morning. And we're going to close in a, a song of, of worship, but also a song of prayer. And what I want to challenge our congregation, challenge us today with, is that first and foremost, God wants us to be able to be people who can extravagantly love the way that we have been loved. To be able to push through the pain and the hurt and the misunderstandings and the sufferings that we go through in life. But in truth, the only way that that's possible, the only way that that kind of love really plays a factor in our marriage relationships and our relationship with our children and our family members and those we get along with and those that we don't, the only way that this extravagant love really makes a difference is when we first understand it and receive it from God himself. And for many of us, maybe we have at some point in our faith journey, somewhere along the way, we have embraced and known the pouring of God's extravagant love for us. But if you're like me and many others, sometimes busyness and life and circumstances just kind of cloud that memory out and we forget what it's like to just be soaking in the extravagant love of God. And so as a way of prayer, as a way of response, I want to open up our altar this morning and simply invite you to come just come and just, just kind of just be in God's presence. Just tell him that you love him. Tell him that you want to know his extravagant love in a real fresh way so that you can take that love and share it with somebody else. It starts by us understanding it. Now you could do that in your pew. But sometimes we get distracted by the people around us and so that's why I want to invite you to come. If the altars fill... We've got some open pew spots where we can just stand and fill the front. But let's just not close out today and just kind of say the service is over. But let's, let's close out by just spending a few moments to tell the Lord, it's more important to me that I know, I really know the extravagant love that you have given to me personally. Because it is through understanding and knowing that, that just maybe I might be able to learn to extravagantly love my wife, my husband, my children, my coworkers, my, the people around me, those people that I find it very difficult to love. It's possible, but it's really only possible when we, that love comes from God's extravagant love. So as we sing and as we close in worship, would you come and just kind of simply tell the Lord you want to be here with him today and you want him to lead you in this, in this love today.
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could 